Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar that is part of Scala's Love of Learning series. I am delighted to welcome tonight Mother Prioress Noella, a Benedictine nun who is joining us from her cell in Puget Sound. We shall hear more from her in just a moment, but let me just quickly introduce um, this webinar series and say, first of all, I would like to really thank our co-sponsor tonight, uh, the Catholic Studies Program at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul. I'd like to thank my collaborator and good friend there, Erica Kidd, for co-sponsoring this. I would also like to thank all of the generous donors to Scala Foundation who make this and other webinars possible. I see that many of you are joining us from all different corners of the country, from different faith backgrounds, just as a way of letting other people know who's here tonight, please feel free to write in the chat box your name and where you're joining us from. So please put into the chat box your name, where you're joining us from. And later on, uh, we are going to have time for a Q&A with Mother Prioress Noella after I have a discussion with her. But I will just let you know that the best way to submit questions is through the Q&A box. Um, so use the chat box to introduce yourself to the group, use the Q&A box to submit questions. If you think of a question while we're talking, please go ahead and submit it. Um, or you can wait until the Q&A starts about 45 minutes into the conversation. Well, I have to say my first encounter with Mother Prioress Noella had a huge influence on the founding of Scala Foundation. I'll tell you more about my first visit to Regina Laudis in a moment, but let me just introduce Scala to those of you who may be joining Scala for the first time. I started Scala Foundation in 2016 because I really believe in the liberal arts model of education grounded in friendship and community. Nowadays, having students really interact with each other at a deep level and building the bonds of trust that help spur creativity and imagination across fields is extremely important to me. In its first four years, Scala has done an intensive summer program on liberal arts education. And the first three, pre-COVID, took place at Benedictine monasteries. Mm -hmm. um, Ampleforth Monastery in the UK, as well as Portsmouth Abbey in Rhode Island. I've also taken students to the Monastery of Regina Laudis multiple times. And I hope to, re to resume such visits when possible. In fact, I'm so grateful to Mother Noella for being here tonight because we were supposed to, I was actually supposed to visit her monastery in March of 2019. To, but that got canceled due to COVID. However, given that that didn't happen, I invited her to do a webinar. And I think now we can go ahead and jump right in. Okay, so um, let me just, let me just ask you, Sister mm -hmm. Noella, I think we have here tonight, a lot of people who are newcomers to the monastic way of life. So before we jump mm -hmm. into the specific uh, topic or elemental, as you put it, which mm -hmm. you practice as a nun, which is cheese making and chanting, I want to ask before we get into that specific, would you tell us a little bit about what led you to join the Abbey of Regina Laudis, if I'm not mistaken, in 1973, which was 47 years ago? <laughs> yes. Well, I think it's important um, for your guests to know that in the late 60s, early 70s, um, college students from Washington, D.C., Boston, New York, started going to this Benedictine monastery in Connecticut. And we were not going because we were looking for a monastery. Uh, many of us had stopped going to church. Most of us brought up Catholic uh, this was the time of the Vietnam War, and we had um, lost faith in our government and in authority. So we were the freedom seekers. And so uh, a friend had gone to Regina Laudis and said, I think you would love it there. And I couldn't imagine that I, I would. 
a Catholic monastery, but she said, you know, what they really help you with is finding peace personally. Mm -hmm. And so many of us went, men and women, and they saw in us a generation that they thought was going to go down the tubes because we were so disillusioned. And here we were, had been given every uh, material uh, riches from our families. We were at wonderful universities and we were wondering why we were there, you know, what the future held. And so they allowed us to come and we would meet every few months as a group. And I think in many ways, what they saw in us was in kind of a lost innocence and they helped us refine that innocence. And it, as I say, it wasn't because I knew who St. Benedict was. It was more, I fell in love with this community of amazing women. And think, this is a cloistered monastery. So the community is behind a grill. And this is a, a group of young students who were looking for freedom and had broken through every structure possible. So they reintroduced us to life-giving life structures. And we then could see the need for discipline and structure. And we fell in love with the community and then could some of the, the men discovered they had vocations to the priesthood or to become monks. Others met their spouses at the monastery. And then I discovered I had a religious vocation and it shocked me. I had not been thinking of being a nun my whole life, believe me, nor my friends. And I think that's an important thing to know that people will ask, well, how did you know? Well, I think it's the same way you know when you fall in love with someone. It's a mystery and you can't really describe it, but you know, if you don't pursue it or pursue that person, you will regret it. And so I've had no regrets. It's been an amazing life. And I've gotten to know who this St. Benedict is so much more throughout all of the, these years as a Benedictine. So that's really um, how I ended up being, being a nun. Well, that's, I have so many questions I could ask you about that, but I wanna highlight what you said that the time in which you entered the monastery was a time of student protests or a lot of just yes. protests against the Vietnam yes. War. It was a time of really social and cultural revolution in many ways. Mm. And it was a time when a lot of people felt displaced or in your words, disillusioned and not yes. trusting authority. So you said that you began to visit the monastery and it was through those visits and getting to know, first of all, getting to experience what a monastic way of life is, that you began to rethink things and began to actually find it appealing to have a certain kind of, you called it life-giving structures and discipline. Now, 47 years later, you probably could not have imagined that 47 years later, you would be in your cell doing a webinar with me. But could you tell us about living? Okay, so you're behind a grill and you have a cell. So just tell our community here gathered tonight, where are you tuning in from, sister? Well, at the moment, I'm tuning in from this monastery, Our Lady of the Rock, and it's a foundation of Regina Laudis in Connecticut. So we're on Shaw Island, which in the San Juan Islands off the coast of Washington State. So I'm in the Northwest, and um, this is a tiny island, uh, isolated and quite, quite beautiful. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I first met you, I don't even remember the year, 2014 or 15, maybe when you were at Regina Laudis, which is in yes. Bethlehem, Connecticut. And I experienced, I went because I wanted to take a group of students who were, who were curious. And I think they were going through a lot of the same questions that you were talking about. Since then, I have been blessed to go back to Benedictine monasteries. And I have studied this great saint, St. Benedict, but I have to tell you, in all my other years of Catholicism, I didn't know anything about him. So before we get into the topic tonight of cheese making and chanting, and could you tell us just briefly, who is this St. Benedict? The saint? Well, St. Benedict lived, we think his dates are about um, 480 to 547 AD. We don't know exactly, 
but um, he was an Italian. And um, as was the custom then, his parents sent him to Rome to study. But at this point, the Roman Empire was beginning to disintegrate. So he saw what was going on there, uh, corrupt barbarian invasions, moral corruption, political corruption, and he didn't want to stay in Rome. So he left. That was not his parents' plans, but um, he left and he went to Subiaco and he lived in a cave for three years. So this was something you can imagine um, his family and his parents, you know, what's happened to our son. And um, he lived in this cave by himself. And eventually people started coming to him for guidance and counsel. So he had to leave his solitude of his cave and he started forming monasteries. And before this, we had the Desert Fathers of the East who were hermits who lived alone. But Benedict felt that men needed to live together to be saved. So we call him the father of Cenobitic life. That would be men, monks and nuns living in common. And he um, started 13 monasteries in that area. And eventually, because they say, because someone tried to poison him, a priest, um, he eventually went to Monte Cassino. And uh, it was there at Cassino that he wrote his holy rule for monks. And that has something, you know, has lasted for centuries that monasteries live by, but also the laity, many live by it. And there's no detail that he leaves out in, in the rule of St. Benedict. Um, it's an amazing document. And the only other real information we have on Benedict himself is because of what Pope St. Gregory the Great wrote about 50 years after Benedict's death which is the second book of dialogues um, and it's the life and miracles of St. Benedict. Mm. So we know very little, but the rule says so much about him. Well, I think it's fascinating. Now, I really recommend that listeners take a look at the rule of St. Benedict. It's actually quite short, but in such, it's astounding that that document has been the constitutional foundational document for thousands of monasteries for what 1400 years but I have to admit to you sister that as a scholar and as a as a bookworm I needed to read more books about Saint Benedict and I needed to have conversations about them to understand so I really love it's dry I mean it's dry it's juridical you have to picture the kind of monastery he had Many of the wealthy were giving their sons to the monastery. He had children in the monastery. He had barbarians. He had people who couldn't read, who couldn't write, and all ages. So he had to lay, lay down so many rules. And yet he has this insight about human nature and this compassion. You know, in the midst of all these rules, he said, you have to have two vegetables at the meal in case someone can't eat one kind, you know, he would, or, or a beautiful uh, cha chapter in the rule, um, he talks about, you know, you have to give the strong something to strive after, but also be very aware of the weak and the fragile, mm -hmm. a bruised reed I will not crush. So in a sense, everyone is not treated the same. And that can be hard in community. Well, why is that person treated that way? And I'm being challenged. Well, yeah. Maybe you're one of the strong and you need to go further. So his grasp of human nature is, is profound. Well, and one of the elements that distinguishes the Benedictine way of life is this principle of aura at, aura at labora, work yes. and prayer. And there was something mm -hmm. about St. Benedict that he really valued manual labor, getting, getting your fingers dirty, right? Um, mm. And why is, what is Ora Labora and why is manual labor so central to the Benedictine way of life? Well, Ora et Labora, it means pray and work. And we do plenty of both. And uh, for one, one reason, he says idleness is the enemy of the soul. So he wanted to keep the, the monks busy. And he, but he also said a monk is truly a monk if he lives by the work of his hands. So there's an aspect 
obviously where the sustenance of the community, taking care of the land, cooking, taking care of animals, that's an important reason for work. And that's true, I think, with every monastery. Um, and we should probably say that the Cistercians and Trappists also follow the will of St. Benedict. So, but what we have found in our community, and I think that would be true for most, work can also um, open up a whole new world to you. And in our community, um, well, I should say, in the dialogues of Pope um, St. Gregory about St. Benedict, he said that just before he died, he had a vision of the whole world in a ray of light. And that's something that we have pondered because we feel it is constitutive to being a Benedictine. It's a comprehensive vision. And yet, how do you get into the comprehensive, comprehensive or the universal? You need a way in. You need a specific entrance point. And what we call that in our work area or a place that we develop, we call it an elemental. Mm -hmm. So it's an area and that's where in the community, when you come in, you may never have had the chance to work a farm. Um, I certainly never milked cows uh, or worked the land. Most of us hadn't. You get a, a chance, the nuns do, but also we have interns that come. You get to try things you've never done before. And then you may really respond to something. So then you get to do more of that and do research. Of course, everyone cleans the house and there are other things we all do, but we encourage each, each person to find something she loves to do because you don't want a community of sad people. You want people to be passionate about something. And also uh, I think for us, it's an aspect of our lexio, meaning reading um, and meditating, and it, it enriches our spiritual life because, for instance, many of the fathers of the church would use analogies to the creation to explain something, to explain uh, something about the church or a mystery or a sacrament. And uh, St. Augustine said, uh, some people to learn about God read books. But he said, put your book down, look around, look at nature. And it says, see, God made me. And we get a chance, I think, in doing a what you call, it's called your obedience, your, your job. You get a chance to read creation over and over again. And I think then as you read creation, in my case, it happened to be cheese making. You get to know the laws of creation. And I think then you make analogies to spirituality. But it's, it's based in something concrete, you know, in matter. And those laws, you can't just change. You have to learn from it. So I think for us, it's, yes, it's to sustain the community, but it also enriches our spirituality. This is extremely interesting, Mother Noella. What you said was that St. Benedict wanted to create a community where you could somehow, you know, to imagine the giant universe that we're all part of, but you need a way in, you need something concrete. Yes. And I think so often people think of someone's called to the monastic life or the religious life, and they're going to contemplate and maybe, you know, levitate or something um, and experience this mystical union with God all the time. And then you no. read the rule of St. Benedict and you visit a Benedictine community. And, you know, my students said, I didn't know nuns knew how to use chainsaws. You know, we do this very demanding manual labor, but the word you used was elemental, mm -hmm. that in order to be able to better capture the mystery of creation, that's also matter, right? Creation is matter yes. in the world, but we can never hold it all. We need to enter in somehow. And so yes. you use the analogy as well, this term lexio, reading, like a contemplative reading of nature. Is that, yes. can you tell us a little bit more about that and a little bit more about this, um, this, this, the analogies from the material realm mm -hmm. to the spiritual realm, because I think that's very unique to the Benedictine charisma. Well, I think, I mean, take cheese, for instance, you know, um, and if you think in your own field, there might be a, a metaphorical analogy. You know, the moon is made of green cheese. Now, we know that's not true. You know, we haven't been to the moon and green cheese, you really don't want to eat. So, you know, that doesn't really speak to you when it's just a metaphor, you know, but then 
you get a chance to experience something. So that would be more an experiential analogy. Whereas I could experience, um, you know, I became a microbiologist and working in biochemistry, I could study what um, catalysts do, what enzymes do, because in cheese ripening, it's the enzymes that are so important. Their metabolism breaks down the fat and the um, protein in cheese and produces flavor that we like. So you study enzymes. Enzymes are catalysts that enable a reaction. They bring together two components and then sort of disappear. So an enzyme itself doesn't change, but it's a mediator that brings together two things. Now make an analogy to that and you can see you need mediators like that who don't have the self-interest, you know? So there's that kind of analogy. That's experiential because I've been watching this and studying it. And then eventually there's sort of um, an existential analogy where people, you know, I'm called the cheese nun. So it's, you know, it, I've become this part of matter, you know? And so in some ways it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but if you really go deeply into an aspect, then you can speak that language and then help others in their area find God within their area. Because I think it's what's wonderful about Scala and I think why it so fits into monastic life is that many different professionals and specialists go to monasteries mm. so that they can speak to others. And, you know, they were crossroads of civilization for centuries. And that's, that's what we want because we've each become so specialized. How do we have a dialogue with someone from another specialization? Mm. Wow, that's, oh, wow, that's fascinating. Now, just to get the chronology straight, because um, you mentioned your, that you studied microbiology, right? Your mother, Noella, mother prior yes. Noella, OSB, PhD. So at yes. some point after entering the monastery, your monastic vocation took you back to school and you earned a PhD in microbiology. Is that correct? And I was a college dropout. How they let you into Jordan. the PhD program? Well, I well, I was sent back to school. A group of us we were sent back because we had developed an area. In my case, it happened to be in the dairy and cheese making. But um, none of us had really studied agriculture. We were going back for advanced degrees in agriculture. Uh, so um, I had to start. I had to take undergraduate courses because I didn't have a bachelor's. It was a long process. And I was someone who in high school avoided all science and math. And suddenly I was taking algebra and trigonometry after 12 years as a nun. So this was a challenge for us. We never could have done it without an amazing community. We had to commute an hour and a half to the University of Connecticut. And uh, it was a long, long process. Mine took the longest, of course. Uh, but. It, it became a wonderful journey uh, because the professors, you know, who were, most of them were younger than we were, um, they could see that we could put to use many of the things we were learning so that actually the University of Connecticut would bring classes to the Abbey to see how things could be applied. And so I was supposed to learn nutrition, but the uh, department at UConn, um, the College of Agriculture was very clinically oriented. And then I arrived with this moldy cheese that I had developed over the years, according to a traditional French recipe that someone shared. Um, so uh, it, I didn't fit in there. So it was the microbiologists um, who eventually in molecular and cell biology responded to what I was trying to do. And so I ended up in that department in the College of Liberal Arts. So I did I went on for a doctorate. I mean, I had to finish bachelor's and then a master's. And I was blessed to get a Fulbright scholarship to France where I could study um, the natural succession of native cheese ripening fungi within traditional caves and study biodiversity. So your, your path took you to a Fulbright where you studied... Yeah. Uh, cheese caves in France? Did I get that? Yes, yes. Um, because uh, uh, 
a woman from France had shared a traditional recipe with me for making cheese. I made it at the Abbey, um, had many mistakes, but it's a very traditional sort of primitive technique. So I had developed that. And when she came back after two years, she was amazed to see, and we don't add commercial cultures of fungi or bacteria, which most cheesemakers do. Um, she was amazed we had the same fungi or the microorganisms on the surface of the cheese that give it flavor as she did in the Massif Central of France. So that was saying something about the, this technique was selecting for microorganisms. Now, this might not interest you, but for the microbiologists, that was very interesting because there's a reason why these populations are growing on this cheese for their own metabolism. So I, ha I had access at the Abbey to a natural cave, which I developed, but I needed access to other caves that were natural. So we applied for a Fulbright, Fulbright and got it. And then the French um, INRA, which is the Institut National de la Recherche Agronomique, which is the National French Agricultural Labs, gave me a fellowship for three more years. So I had an amazing project. My community thought maybe I had married a Frenchman or something, and was she ever coming home? But um, it just seemed to be the perfect place for me and for that project. And also the woman who founded Regina Laudas had come from France to found the Abbey in America. So even though she was an American, she spent most of her life in, in France and survived World War II. So for us, it was very meaningful to have a project so rooted in the French earth, considering the history of our foundation. That's fantastic. And in the article which you have published in Communio, the, in the International Catholic Review, you talk about this cheese making and relate it to the Benedictine way of life. In particular, I wonder if you could comment perhaps on another principle of Benedictine way of life, whereas some Catholic um, religious orders are missionaries and they, they go places, mm -hmm. and they move around. Benedictines take a vow of stability. And you talk yes. about this principle of terroir, which is in the cheese world, the relationship between a food and where it comes from. So mm -hmm. can you relate as an example for us? You know, yes. it's not just a question of food tastes better because it comes from this place, but what's the spiritual component of stability and terroir? Mm -hmm. And how is that related to cheese? Well, you know, the Benedictines, and remember, we're talking with Cistercian also and Trappists, are the only ones who have a vow of stability. Um, that's one of the vows that we take at final vows. So obedience, which is true, I think, for almost all religious orders. But then we have stability and conversatio. Now, stability means that I am vowing myself to God through this community, through this place, but it's really you are identified with the spirit of a community. And so um, actually I have a beautiful quote, which I'm gonna to try to find um, from Thomas Merton, which I love um, because he says, when the monks had found their homes, they not only settled there for better or for worse, but they sank their roots into the ground and fell in love with their wood. Indeed, this love of one's monastery and its surroundings is something integral to the Cistercian life. It forms the object of a special vow, stability. And they say you can recognize a person where they're from by the way they talk, by certain mannerisms, by the way they dress, even though they have the same habit. Um, because of this, you're taking on the character of a community and it's, it's really a marriage. You know, when you're vowed to a religious life, that's your marriage. So, but uh, the other vow that is really in complement to that is conversatio, which is also unique to us. So conversatio, it has to do with changing your whole way of life and obviously conversion. And it has an aspect of turning, of turning around. And it really is a good balance to stability because as great as stability is, you could become stagnant in staying one way. Whereas Conversatio is saying, I am willing to change every day. And that's something we need, you know, you need in a marriage, you know, to say, okay, we're gonna work this out and I'm willing 
to change. So I think those two vows are an amazing compliment to one another. Wow. Well, another, you know, when you mentioned that conversatio, that yes. vow, vow of conversion, as you put it, um, Another book I've actually been teaching recently is Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger's book, Spirit of the Liturgy. And there's a really interesting chapter on liturgy, history, and cosmos, where he actually says the essence of Christian mystery isn't, con isn't con conversatio in the sense of just rejecting sin, which of course is important, but turning mm. our awareness to God, turning back, yes. right? So when you say conversatio, it's not just kind of always overcoming our, our negative tendencies, but a positive wow. af affirmation of a searching for God. He, Pope Benedict also had a beautiful essay on the Benedictine way called um, uh, Carrere Deum, Seeking God. Mm. So the conversatio yes. is, is seeing that creation began it, that there is an act of creation and that creation has has an end point. It, it, it goes back to its creator. Mm. And so I wonder if you could comment a little bit on that, because one thing I've noticed about creation, it seems to me that most of creation, most of nature is finite. Um, it comes to an end. It, it, mm -hmm. it decays. Now, in the case of cheese making, if I'm correct, the decay is actually part of the flavor in some way. But how do you, as a Benedictine sister, understand creation and decomposition? And what's the spiritual analogy to creation and, and decomposition or even death in the natural world? Well, it, it's something, since I've studied cheese ripening, um, as long as I have, uh, I begin to have these insights because basically, what you're studying is the breakdown of when you think of these components in milk and then in a young cheese, we're talking about lactose, that's the carbohydrate in milk. You're talking about protein and then you're talking about lipids or fat. And so the microorganisms contribute their enzymes. They're getting food and a place to live on the cheese. And then the cheese is changing its flavor and its composition. So basically these things are being broken down. So creating flavor through breakdown and some of the best cheeses, which Americans 20 years ago were not into smelly cheeses the way they are now. I couldn't even get people at our annual fair, you know, years ago to even taste this cheese that had mold on. It. Now that has changed drastically. Americans have traveled. They know much more about food. Um, people like a nice smelly monster. And an orange monster, that cheese, the bacterium that's creating that color is the same bacterium that makes feet smell. So these microorganisms are the locker room smell. The microorganisms are actually things that are on our body that we don't like to talk about necessarily. So that's what these small, these strong flavors are because something, especially protein, is being broken down. And yet People love this cheese. And it just had dawned on me uh, as I pondered this that it, I think it's an unconscious way of preparing you for death because you are eating a breakdown product and it's delicious. And suddenly, you know, even though there's one end of a cycle, you talk about the end of a cycle, at the same time, there's something opening up uh, that, you know, is unexpected. And I love uh, this, this quote, I have it in my communal, communal article by Richard John Newhouse. Um, he wrote death on, on a Friday afternoon, meditation on the last words of Jesus from the cross. And what he's saying is, don't rush into the resurrection. Don't be afraid of the tomb. And I think this is beautiful part where he said, um, I might as well read it. By these three days, he's talking about Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. All the world is called to attention. Everything that is and ever was and ever will be, the macro and the micro, the galaxies beyond number and the microbes beyond notice, everything is mysteriously entangled with what happened. With what happens in these days? Every human life conceived from eternity and destined to eternity here finds its story truly told. 
In this killing that some call senseless, we are brought to our senses. Here we find out who we most truly are because here is the one who is what we are called to be. The derelict cries, come follow me. Follow him there? We recoil, we close our ears. We hurry on to Easter, but we will not know what to do with Easter's light if we shun the friendship of the darkness that is wisdom's way to light. Wow, that's beautiful. Isn't it? Wow, you know, I'm terribly interested in this topic. If I understood you correctly, what Father Richard John Newhouse was saying was if to, to be able to enter into the darkness that sometimes we experience as humans, perhaps it's psychologically or mm -hmm. any physical pain we experience because of illness or even thoughts about our own mortality. They, they can be scary or the mortality of loved ones. And this idea mm -hmm. of not rushing through those moments, you, you phrased it as in those moments, there can be an opening up to another reality, something new, something, mm -hmm. something unexpected. And so what that, I think what that I think shows is that our material created reality also has a, there is a longing for that to continue, yet we have to face this reality that it doesn't continue in the way that we, in, in purely natural created way, but that yes. there is something new or something unexpected that can come. And so during this, for example, penitential time of Lent, I was saying to students in class this week that as Catholics were asked to actually sacrifice something, not yes. because, you know, having my second or third or fourth cup of coffee or cappuccino or whatever is a bad thing, but mm -hmm. simply that by voluntarily sacrificing something in the material world, that opening up to the spiritual can happen. And so I wonder if you know, I've lived in Latin America and I've traveled in Haiti where people seem to be more comfortable with illness and with mortality. Whereas here yeah. in the United States, I think right now we're living through a very difficult time and not to downplay. Yes. I mean, I've had friends who have passed away from COVID, people who have been sick, but I was on a panel a week ago about suicide with a philosopher, mm. a comedian and an existential, mm. oh, sorry, an existentialist philosopher, a comedian and a psychiatrist. And one of my take home points from that was that when people are experiencing darkness psychologically, it's important to be present, um, not to try to analyze what's going on, mm. but to be present, to be fully human. And mm. so I wonder when people visit monasteries as I have, with my students, even without knowing all of this scaffolding we've done about the Benedictine way of life, mm. how is it that people come to visit these monasteries and feel that they can enter into this way of life? Um, and what have you found in all of your years about people like myself who come visit the monasteries? What are they mm. looking for when they visit? And how does this charism, this beautiful way of life that you have spread to your visitors? Well, I think, uh, you know, sometimes we've found that people who come to live at the monastery and our new interns, what happens to them is not what they expected. And we've often found, because many, many women come to the Abbey, to, it's time away from their families and away from, you know, what they have to do every day. Women are usually the last ones to take care of themselves, so they can come and have time apart. It's their contemplative time. And often people will cry and they say, I don't know why I'm crying. And it's because I think it gives them a chance out of the rat race of everything they have to do and carry daily. And it's the same with professionals. You know, you can't be too vulnerable in your profession. You have to keep a certain persona within your professional life. But you come to a monastery and so we are a bigger center of integration and you can kind of let your hair down. You can let go. And also, I think because of the grill, you know, because of the enclosure, I think people feel safe. I think they feel I'm in this place apart and you don't go there to escape your life, but hopefully you leave with new insights. Um, I love uh, from, from the Ratzinger report, 
um, which was uh, Pope Benedict XVI wrote in 1985, he said there was a misunderstanding of contemplative life. It used to be called the fuga seculi, the flight from the world. And he said, you didn't go apart from the world to abandon the world, but you are set apart to get another perspective. And the monasteries tried out new models of civilization to give back to the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what a guest I feel would find in coming apart there's time for new insights to get regenerated, new energy, hopefully, to go back to your family, back to your profession, um, energized in, in a new way. So it's really a very small monastic experience, but everyone needs that. Right. Well, that has been my experience. I first vis you know, visited a Benedictine monastery in Charlotte, North Carolina, where Belmont mm -hmm. Abbey College is, and they had a guest master and I called the number and they let me come. Mm -hmm. I think now because of COVID, most monasteries aren't doing that, but it will be resumed. And when mm -hmm. I took students to Regina Laudis, what they actually experienced was this integration that you talked about. Now, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, you had us working with chainsaws and getting really dirty. And I tried to pet the llama and they told me to get away because it might kick me but I did pet the sheep and I saw the chickens and it did feel like a time apart from my daily routines you know I just to give an example I think I did more work to prepare for this webinar tonight than you did in terms of my hair and my nails and my makeup which I don't think you, you did. look good well, I'll tell you, when I went to the monastery and we did all that agricultural work, we were sweaty and we're praying, you know, it's a busy weekend. And I got back in the pickup, in the SUV with the girls I was with, and I confessed to them that I had not showered all weekend. And I said, I didn't actually notice anybody else taking a shower. Did anyone take a shower? And it turned out nobody did the entire weekend. We had a wonderful time and you worked us to death. So mm. I, next time I thought, let me take some men. So I took four men from Princeton Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. And while I was talking with you, they did some very heavy manual labor and they carried some things to the blacksmith shop. And mm. apparently they were just killing it out there in the fields. Mm. And so when I went back to the women's guest house, another woman who was staying there said, oh, are you the professor of those four young bucks? Oh. And, <laughs> and I said, ah, uh, yes, I guess I am. And she proceeded to tell me how amazing they were. So the next morning, I don't think I told you this, next morning I went to go pick up those students and I said, guess what guys? Somebody asked me if I was the professor of the four young bucks. And they laughed so hard that we came up with the name of a show that I hope happens someday. We wanted to have a, a concert and we wanted to name it Dr. Mooney and the Four Young Bucks. Oh, I love it. With I a special appearance, with a special appearance by the cheese nun. Oh, here we go. <laughs> colon, colon, Gregorian yeah. singing for kingdom building. Oh, it's wonderful. So let I me just repeat that. Dr. Gonna Mooney, it's going to be a hit. Dr. Mooney and the Four Young Bucks with a special appearance by the Cheese Nun, Gregorian singing mm -hmm. for kingdom building. Now, I good. laughed so hard all the way into mass that I was giggling the entire time during mass. At it's all right. That's mass. okay. But I also used that story to transition into another fundamental part of monastic life, which is... Gregorian singing. Could you tell us about the art and the craft? Why is Gregorian singing so important and how do you do it? Well, it's interesting that this is um, coming after the Dr. Mooney and the four bucks because, uh, <laughs> you know, when these young people, we were the young uh, community in the late 60s who went to the Abbey, um, when we heard the Gregorian chant, we fell in love with it. Now you have to picture, some of us had left the church, many of us had never heard the chant. Uh, and this was a time after the Second Vatican Council when many religious orders were considering, should we sing in the vernacular? Should we sing in English? Do we wanna continue singing in Latin and Gregorian? And we were like, please don't ever stop singing this. Now we didn't understand the words necessarily, but it spoke in a deeper place. 
And that's what I think um, is part of the power of Gregorian chant is music that is that good is eternal. You know, it has been sung for centuries and I think it will into the future. And that's what I think is one thing that gets people is the eternality of chant. And then it's also universal. I think you're in touch with the whole world and every culture. And the chant itself is such a brilliant form of music. Now, keep in mind, I you know, had never sung the chant. I couldn't read music when I entered, and, but I loved it. And so when Lady Abbess, our foundress, who was really um, brought up in a very classical way at, at the Abbey of Notre Dame de Joire, um, I responded to the chant and I pointed out something to her that I loved, one little phrase, about a month after I entered. And she asked me, do you want to learn more? And I said, I do. So she took me by myself and she said, well, I want to hear your voice. Would you sing something for me? So didn't I sing Billie Holiday, The Man I Love? And here she was, you know, this classical, uh, very contained woman that she was. She, she didn't say, oh, what is this? She just said, well, well, that's a nice song. And she got to hear my voice. But that was one of the things that I think um, is very unique to the Abbey uh, that was so important is that you arrived with the music that you were used to, you know, and it wasn't frowned upon because what we do is we take that energy. For instance, you know, I was most familiar with rock and roll. You know, my brother played at Woodstock. I love rock and roll. And, um, you know, the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and James Brown, I saw them all. And so I loved that music. But one of the things we tried to talk about at the Abbey is what is the drive under something? And when we were trying to figure out what is it on a primitive level that you, is under chant, not, not talk about the technique and the modes and the scales. And what we came up with was this phrase, it's a primitive diaphragmatic cry. And I think, you know, you mentioned um, the amount of suicide and the, the pain that people are feeling. Chant can integrate a cry, you know? And sometimes I think when people think I'm singing church music, it's like from the neck up. And that is not what that music should be. You have to give your whole body to it and your soul and your voice to that. So what the community did is take sort of that raw material that many of us brought and formed it in chant. And that's something I do as a chant teacher. So that then you learn to read music and it's um, the rhythm of Gregorian is critical and it's the relationship between the Latin accent and the rhythm of the chant that makes it brilliant, but also it's modal music. And that is something um, I would suggest if people can find it is to watch Leonard Bernstein's Young People's Concerts. They were from the 60s where he talks about what is a mode. And basically he was explaining to them that his daughter had been trying to play the chords of a Beatles song on her guitar. And he said, you can't because it's modal music. This is music that many uh, musicians were picking up in the 60s, but it's music that was much more ancient than the modes that we knew, the, the modern modes, you know. So this music was more ancient than Bach and Brahms. And it's basically what gives it a quality that grabs you is because of the modal scales where the intervals of the half and whole steps are, that is what gives the quality of each mode an emotion, you know, that you can't describe. So I think that's one of the, um, the wonderful things for us was being accepted for who we were and then being formed in this classical way of music. That's fascinating. Well, I shared in the chat box of the video, the Leonard Bernstein video you mentioned, but I will say, mm -hmm. Mr. Noella, understanding the chant that you do, I think is difficult in the abstract. I will say when yes. I was at Ampleforth Abbey in the UK with students, we were there for an entire week and they, mm. they pray the hours, they chant the songs, mm -hmm. 
six times a day. And I wasn't planning on going, I'm not going to lie. I was going to like go when I felt like it. Well, one student in the class named Juan Pablo, who's a good friend of mine, took care of me after mm. a car accident. He said, well, if I'm going to be in a monastery, I'm going to do all six times a day for seven days. And I thought, wow. He can't beat me. So out of pride, we would mm-hmm. chase each other out the door just in time. But the point mm-hmm. I want to make is that you chant on a regular schedule and yes. you chant as a community. And I will say yes. that until I did it six times a day, okay, Juan Pablo and I ended up tying. We each missed three times. We missed three mm-hmm. times out of six times seven, right? <laughs> what we did. That's it, pretty great. We did it. Yeah. There was a transformative effect of the rhythm of it and the need to, you're chanting as a body. Um, your, your own body is engaged, as you say, but you're chanting as a body, as a body of people. Now, the monks don't like it if you come in late and they don't like it if you're not singing with them, you know, so you're, you're singing. Of course. So, but there's something transformative about it. And when I went to the Sunday liturgy, the full mass, it seemed to kind of complete what I had been doing all week long. Um, so, but you are a Beatles so fan. So they let you. You were a rock fan. So it's not that there's other kinds of music that we can enjoy, but you're saying there's something mm-hmm. particular to this kind of music that lifts the soul. Yes, and it takes a submission. I mean, you have to practice, first of all, um, and you have to learn, you know, it's a four-line staff. So I really learned to read music on a four-line staff, which is the Gregorian. So you have to know the notes that you're singing and then some idea of the Latin, how to pronounce it, and then the rhythm. That takes years. But the wonderful thing about a community is you kind of just come in and jump on the train so that you don't have to, you're not going to learn it all overnight. It takes time. So you kind of jump on the train and sing with the community and then you you study. But it also takes a lot of submission because one person's idea of tempo might be different than the other person. And believe me, there can be wars fought over, you know, how fast or how slow something should be. And imagine you're in this choir and let's say, you know, there's tension between two people or that someone's had a fight. It can happen in a monastery of women. I know it's shocking, but then you have to go in and stand next to that person and harmonize. You know, that's tricky. And also Gregorian chant, I should say, because I use the word harmonize and it's a little misleading because it's monophonic, meaning it's not two different melodies being sung at once. It's only one. So it's one voice. And that's a very demanding part of chant because everything stands out because it's monophonic, you know, versus polyphonic music. So that's an important thing. And and it's not easy to do. But you also, you know, at the Abbey, we have a lived tradition of chant. And that is critical because we use the Salem method, which was, you know, developed at the um, Abbey of Salem in France. And uh, we were blessed that Dom Joseph Gajar, who was the master there, um, actually worked with our community in the United States. And then um, Dr. Theodore Marie, who studied under Dom Gajar, he worked with our community and he directed some of our CDs. And then our abbess, Lady Abbess, taught us. And then our second abbess, Abbess David, taught us. She was choir director and directed a CD. It's a living tradition. And even though there are scholars all over the world studying the ancient manuscripts, and then they can have you know big disagreements about how this noom should be sung. And how was it sung, you know, in the year 800? We, you know, that wouldn't be what we would do. We are using this method. And then as a community, we will take this orientation and sing this together. And one of the things that we've often thought about is, you know, ultimately after the work of preparation, translating, learning your notes, learning the the, the melody and the rhythm, ultimately it's a prayer and it's communal prayer. And we've said, if you really let go, say that word, the word of God, it will come back and penetrate you. It will speak to you. And that's part of that, the power of it, of the chant. Right. Well, I want to move into questions from the audience. So please start uh, 
questions, but let me just respond a little bit to what you said while I let people put questions in the Q&A mm-hmm. button and tie it back to your own nickname, the Cheese Nun. Um, you know, you described the qualities of the Gregorian chant, its modal nature, its monophonic, but you also said that it's really mm-hmm. important, this, this living tradition of it is part of how you sustain community life, because I really can't imagine what it's like to be living in a monastery with the same people for 47 years, you know, I get annoyed at myself, you know, much less how someone else walks or eats or talks, much less what they say, you know. So you made this analogy that through chanting, it actually has a unifying effect on the community. And in some ways, even a healing effect on the wounds that can arise between sisters out of misunderstandings. And the similarity I see, I don't know if it's, if I'm correct, the similarity I see with that in your name, the cheese nun, you know, that's kind of a funny name yet people laugh at it. People remember it. We have the cheese heads in Wisconsin, you know, the football, I think for the green Bay Packers. So the fact that a human being, you would be identified with cheese, which is not human, Mm. It's strange, but it's counterintuitive, but it's, but it's telling us something. It's telling mm. us that in a way you and cheese have a kind of unity in diversity. Mm. And similarly, it sounds like in the chanting you're talking about that there's something about the lived tradition of the chant, both the content. It sounded to me like you're talking both about the content of the chant, its musical properties, as well as how mm. it's practiced helps build unity in diversity amongst the community. Would you say that that's correct? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's challenging to get to that point. But when it happens, it is such a release for the community. And you know, when we're training people vocally, um, we encourage each woman to find her own voice. And also we I teach the men and women's choir. I have for years at the Abbey. Uh, we want people to really find their own voice. And when you hear the choir, you will hear different voices, even though it's monophonic. And that's fine with us. You know, we don't want to sound like one little sweet sound of a a disembodied woman. We want to sound like a group of women who are grounded in the earth, committed to one another, who are passionate. Because in the Psalms, that's all there. The Psalm has every kind of emotion in it of hate, jealousy, love, celebration, joy. The Psalms, and that's what we're singing in in the office and in in mass is the Psalms, um, bring your lived experience. And that's what we talk about when we have rehearsals. How does this relate to what's happening today in the community? And I also think, um, I know we wanna get to the questions, is chant can change you. Um, When you're at a funeral and you sing this really simple, Requiem Kyrie. It's four or five notes. It's a light six mode. It's not lugubrious. It's not sad. It is this joyful, hopeful piece. And that's something that the chant, it, I think the chant pulls you forward. It changes you even as you're singing it. I know um, when my mother passed away uh, fairly young, um, she had passed away at night. 11 o'clock at night. And the next morning, I woke up singing this beautiful first mode, Alleluia, cantate domino, canticum novum, sing to the Lord a new song. That was an unconscious thing that happened, but I felt that even the chant was pulling me forward into something new that was going to happen for her, and I would would find her after that. But it was just, I think that's the power of this modal music we call chant. Wow. Would you say the Salve Regina is an example of this modal music? Oh, it certainly is. Well, that's my story now. And then I want to move into the questions. But when we went back to Ample Fourth Abbey the second time, unfortunately, the monk's home was under construction. So they couldn't chant in the church with us. So we went on our own and we sang together and it was great. But one day we just spontaneously started singing the Salve Regina. And Mm -hmm. it was just, it just went to the depths of my soul. Mm -hmm. And 
a few years later, when a young student who had a huge inspiration on me starting Scala, his name was John Artunian, he, he mm. passed away at a very young age of cancer. And at, at his grave, when we were burying him and we were so sad, one of the students mm. began singing the Salve Regina. And there we all mm. were. These were the same students I had had in my living room, the mm -hmm. same students who had gone with me to Ampleforth. And now we were burying a student who we all loved, their, their mm -hmm. friend, my student. But that mm -hmm. Salve Regina came out spontaneously. Everybody started singing it. And as you said, it felt like, although we were sad and looking into the grave, we were also lifting up our hopes and our faith in knowing that he's gone home to God, even though we're mm -hmm. suffering. And you know, a year, less than a year later, that young man, unfortunately, his father passed away of COVID. Mm. And it was during the shutdown when you couldn't leave the house. And I was mm. so upset. And I couldn't go see, you know, John's mother and the widow. And I was, I was very upset. But I, I began singing the Salve Regina. And I'm going to say this publicly. I've never said this publicly. I began singing that. And I don't have mystical experiences, sister. I wish I did. But I heard voices. Mm. And I suddenly felt like I wasn't singing alone. Mm -hmm. And I, I just felt, and I thought, you know what, a few years ago, I would have suppressed that and thought, mm -hmm. oh, that's crazy. Don't think that. But I couldn't get those voices out of my head, singing the Salve mm -hmm. Regina with me. And so I think there's something about these chants that help heaven and earth meet. I totally agree. It puts you in touch with the dead. It does. The chant does. And I think for that student that decided to sing it, it's in his memory. It was in his memory and it, and it came out. And when you think of the words of the Salve, to thee do we cry from this valley of tears, you know, uh, that says it all more than the words that we could come up with, mm -hmm. you know, the valley of tears. So that's, that's the wonderful gift that we have that this, this, uh, patrimony of this music that can express every emotion right. and give us hope. Exactly. And I think this is the question I want to lead into that's coming in from the audience. But I think part of the, you know, why are people like me, you know, attracted to people like you? You know, why are people, young people or not so young people anymore like me being attracted to this way of life? And I think that there's something about the chanting of the Psalms that's uh, an express an ex or the Salve Regina, which isn't the Psalms, it's a hymn to the Virgin Mary, but it's a lamentation, yes. but it's a hopeful lamentation. Yes. And so what I found mm -hmm. in the monastery, and I wonder if this has also been your experience, that why monastic theology and why monasticism today? And I think that it's the integration of the manual labor, the chanting, the commitment to place, the, the natural foods, right? There's a lot of organic foods or a lot of just natural local products in monasteries. And you can then experience this integration. And we started off this webinar talking about the fragmentation that you experienced as a young woman and the questioning and the seeking that led you to the monastery that led you to find a vocation. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if today we're not also in a time where a lot of young people are feeling dislocated mm -hmm. or not sure of their identity, not sure of the meaning of their life or not sure why they're working so hard. So just mm -hmm having welcomed young people as visitors to the monastery for so many years, what advice do you give them for discerning the will of God in their own lives? That's what one young, young man is asking. And in particular, because as you said, most people who visit the monasteries aren't going to stay. So mm -hmm. how do you think visiting the monastery helps people discern their, the will of God? Well, as I said earlier, I just think for one thing to be apart from your daily life, you know, where you can be more vulnerable and listen. I think it's a question if you have the space and the time and the enclosure to listen. And I think um, that's another thing that happens when you would go to like the Abbey is you get to speak to someone, you know, one of the nuns, a guest uh, mistress. And I hope that she could help you even try to figure out what is urging in you and to say, you know, go for it. Or maybe this would be a good place to pursue that. Or, uh, you know, we're not counselors and we don't want to be counselors, but it's, you know, we're trying to 
help people find peace. You know, and we write pox on the top of everything that we write. Um, peace, that's what people are looking for. And I think um, one of the things, you know, as we've talked about um, death is, I think in monastic life, you get to live the cycles of life, of birth and death with the animals, with creation. But also we celebrate the liturgy, you know, the cycle of Christ's life. And I think in living that, because we felt despair over the Vietnam War and the death we were seeing, and we felt we could not affect anything. Whereas living the, the um, rhythm of a liturgical cycle, then you, you get to know, you know, there's death, but then there's resurrection on the other side. Mm -hmm. Right. So listen, on a practical level, I know some listeners are asking, how do I go visit a monastery? And <laughs> I believe right now, most communities are limiting visitors due to COVID. Yes. But in general, once I discovered these things called monasteries, I discovered there's actually quite a lot of them. There's Benedictines, there's yes. Trappists, there's Cistercians. So mm -hmm. I would recommend to listeners ask around, is there a monastery somewhere near you? And if you go to their website, most of them have a website and most of them will identify somebody who's called the guest master. Is that correct? Is that the right way to contact? Yes. Monastery? Yes. Now the, the Abbey website is my job and um, we don't have we have an address because we don't have people uh, make reservations by email, but they can write to the guest secretary. And you obviously, yeah, right now we can't accept guests, but we're hoping, you know, like everyone else, um, who knows if it's going to be the summer or a bit after, but certainly hospitality is a big part of Benedictine life in the rule. Benedict said, receive everyone as Christ. So you write and suggest dates and say who you are. Um, you know, maybe how you heard of the monastery and, um, and then we have a guest house for men and for women and for families. So, um, and here also at Our Lady of the Rock, where I am now, we also um, have guest houses. It's much smaller, but, um, you know, the guests are very important to us too. Um, and we don't necessarily charge. Um, we want people to be able to we don't want someone not to be able to come because they can't pay. People leave donations. That's wonderful. But, you know, we want this to be a gift for people so that they can come and hopefully have a few peaceful days. Wonderful. Well, it has been my experience with Regina Laudis and other monasteries that I visited that if you approach in a friendly way and an open way and I would like to come and here's my back, here's why I'm interested in mm -hmm. coming. Here are some dates. Usually you, someone does get back to you. And then also, as you said, while you're there, I've always been amazed at the attention that we've received, that yes. one of the monks or nuns goes out of his or her way to accompany you during your stay and make sure you're yes. comfortable to talk to you and to help you discern what it is that might have brought you there. So yes. I highly recommend everybody listening. If you took the time out to listen to this webinar, you need a monastic vacation. And when things open, find one, find one in your area. There are also Anglican communities that live the Benedict yes. by the rule of St. Benedict. There's mm -hmm. one called Holy Cross Monastery, which is Anglican. And I've taken students there. It has a beautiful mm -hmm. view of the Hudson River. So mm -hmm. really this monastic experience is open to, to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say, you know, one other kind of two other questions on the on the chant have, have come in. And, you know, one person is wondering about kind of about the connection between heaven and earth in chant. And again, with this, with this idea of decay and decomposition and, and, and death. Um, but is it possible that chant is a way of actually experiencing the communion of the saints? Because this person says that the doctor said that while they were singing, they couldn't visit, right? Right now, people can't visit. A lot of their mm -hmm. loved ones are dying. But in some, but somehow, the singing they were doing was communicating to him. So yes. Even though he couldn't respond, um, do you think that this is this is possible? I I do, and I think they 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 say also when someone's dying, I believe that hearing is one of the last senses to go, mm -hmm. and I I have often sung chant to someone who is dying. And I think it's a comfort for the person singing too. But I think um, one of our nuns um, who had 
Alzheimer's, who has passed away, um, one of the last things I think she remembered is the chant. And I, when I would sing chant to her, she would actually sing a few lines with me. So I think it's that deep. And, and I think uh, the music itself, the rhythm of it is comforting for people. You know, it isn't bombastic and you don't have loud instruments. It's, it's something that I think could give someone a sense of peace. And people shouldn't worry, you know, oh, do I have a bad voice or am I in tune? That's, you can always work on that. But if, if the emotion is there and you're singing as a gift to someone, soul to soul, that will communicate. Yeah. And I'll just add that singing is something that children love to do, right? Children can yes. do tone and singing before they can speak words. Mm -hmm. And also now with a lot of people living with dementia, um, they can sing and respond yes. to music more than speech, more than, mm -hmm. so it just shows how singing is so integral to who we are as human beings. And it's a powerful form of communication at all stages of life. And yes, mm -hmm. with, with the communion of saints, with, with the dead who have gone yes. before us. Mm -hmm. Another question, it's kind of two related questions. You know, how do people who are not going to commit to a monastery commit to this way of life? Specifically, are there ways to bring chanting into this, into family life with kids of all ages? and? Also, is it possible to live as a lay Catholic person with a small farm and live the kind of Benedictine way in a, in a local home that also has a farming aspect to it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I definitely think it is. I, and I know there are many families who do um, study and read the rule of St. Benedict and, and use his precepts in their family uh, as, as well as, as small farms. And in terms of the chant, uh, now there are so many resources for people to sing the chant and learn the chant. Uh, the Catholic Music uh, the Association of America is fabulous what they have, their site. Um, and there's the Ward Method, which is for teaching children chant. Justine Ward, um, who actually worked with Don Gajar, she founded that. Um, and so there are, there, as I said, there's many ways to learn the chant. If you were to go to the Abbey, um, we have a men and women's choir that we teach. Our interns can learn the chant. Here at Our Lady of the Rock, I teach. If a guest wants to learn chant or our interns, I will teach them. And then um, they can, more than at the Abbey, they can then sing with the community here. Mm. So if you just look online, the conferences, the symposia on chant are fabulous. Mm. There are many masters now that were not there 20 years ago. It's back. Chant is in. So chant is in. Okay. Chant is that's, in. Yes. That's wonderful. And what about farming? What about people who want to be little farmers? Yes. It's not easy. I think, um, you know, it takes a big commitment. It's a lot of work. And I think you have to kind of know what you're getting into, you know, as you start. Certainly, you know, for the small farmers of New England, um, they couldn't make it, the dairy farmers, for the longest time because, you know, they just couldn't make enough money on milk alone, selling uh, fluid milk in comparison to Wisconsin and California. But now that people are into artisanal cheese, which has happened for the last 20 years, that would be what we call a value added product. So, you know, a pound of cheese these days for an artisanal cheese, you could pay, you could pay $25 for it. So you, I think what you have to do is find something of how you're going to specialize so that you can support your family doing that. I and some have done it with cheese. Um, others are doing it, you know, with, with local products and, and gardening. But I think it's very difficult for a small farm in competition with industrial farming now. So I think you have to find sort of a niche that will make it work for you. So it's difficult and hopefully, to sustain. Hopefully a good master too. People that can give you advice. Yeah. Um, you know. But it's possible. So it's difficult to do it to sustain your family economically, but yes. as, as a hobby, as a way of life, as a way of raising a family, perhaps not to make yes. money, but to Yeah. And definitely, you know, people will, they'll have to have chickens and, you know, one, one cow. And, um, and it's great for the children. Yeah. 
So it is possible, even if, if you're not interested in necessarily making the money, you can have a larger plot of land somewhere that allows you to have chickens that are making noise early in the morning. And, yes, yeah, you know, yeah, one pig or, or two. Or, yeah. sh- or yeah. go, you know, the sheep get away and they get lost easy. They really do. Yeah. Um, you know, and gardens. So- I think gardening. people are wanting to grow their own food if possible. Gardening. But again, it's, it's, a, it's every day, you know, and if you're going to milk a cow, she has to be milked you know, every day. So. It's a commitment. It's a it stability. It's a commitment. You know? it, is. And it's, it is. And it's labor. It's labor yeah. intensive. But yes. as you said, I think it's a way of preventing idleness, but it's also a way of doing this, you know, analogical way of thinking and connecting the created world to the spiritual world. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a way for children to explore, to be excited. So I think I want to encourage people to think about doing it. And um, many people go, do internships, Mm-hmm. They will do an internship at a, at a dairy farm or another kind of farm, organic farms. And that gives them a taste of, you know, the possibilities. And I think that would be a good thing also is to get an internship somewhere so that then you have a sense of what's involved. And then you might find the specialization you want to go into. So learning from a master or doing an internship yes. and then taking yeah. that back to your home. Okay. Yeah. Try it out. How... You know, I mean, this is maybe a weird question, sister, but yeah. how typical are you? You know, how is it? I mean, is it normal? One, one student in my class wants to know what led to a number of you from Regina Laudas going back to study agriculture. Was it someone in your tradition? You know, is this, is this common for sisters to go back well, to study advanced degrees as you have? Well, um, in our community, it certainly was unusual. We were the first to do that. And it's because I think what happened when the Abbey was first founded in the very early years, there was one woman in charge of the farm, grew up on a farm in Minnesota. And so she could, you know, to get through that survival period when the community was hungry, um, she, you know, was in charge of the land and the animals. Then we come along, the suburbanite kids who know nothing and get trained. And some learn to drive tractors and others to take care of animals. And, you know, I help feed the pigs, run the child shield. And, um, and then suddenly, you know, we milk cows. And at one point I was asked to try my hand at cheese making. And Lady Abbas knew I loved France anyway. Um, so I helped develop the cheese. So the community reached the point, especially because of regulations in agriculture. And again, we're a small farm and we were up against industrial farming and you know, regulations, we, the community decided to send some of us for advanced degrees so that then we could defend what we were doing traditionally. So it was a sort of a strange thing that we had special permission from the Archbishop, Archbishop Whalen, and um, it was an unusual thing to send cloistered nuns out of the cloister to go to school. And that, that was unusual. Uh, but in the end, it ended up being so good for the community. And then we even still now we call upon the faculty at the University of Connecticut or the extension services. They help us with our agricultural programs. Mm. And it's a great exchange with the university. And I think you've seen we do have many exchanges with universities at the Abbey. So we, we value that exchange. So I think it, it was unusual. I'm not sure we would ever do it again, what it takes to do a doctorate. Um, certainly I think you'd have to be professed and committed in profession because you go through a lot of stress of, you know, okay, I can't go to this prayer because I really have to study, you know, so you have to fight the guilt and you have to be sent into it by the community. We were asked to do it. We didn't just think of this on our own. I think I'll go to Yukon. Uh, so it's something that, you know, you're sent on mission by the community. And it's a lot different when you're studying as part of a community than when you went, when you first went and dad was paying for it. Uh, you know, yeah. so you, you study and you have a reason, you know, I didn't have a reason before to finish my degree. It, it meant nothing to me. Monastic life meant more. So I said, this is it. And they took me and, you know, that meant much more to me. Never dreaming I'd have to then go back and go to school, you know, but I had a reason. 
Well, again, it shows, I think what, you know, is more clear in your article in Communio and other things I've read that the rule of St. Benedict and the Benedictine way, the Benedictine tradition, sure, there's a lot of discipline and you live behind the great, and, but there's also some flexibility and the community oh, absolutely. to this, and it might've been a unique thing. It might not be rec replicable, but it does show a principle of Benedictine life. It's adaptability. You know, yes. you see the Benedictines and have all these monasteries and all these parts of the world, if you weren't adaptable to the mm. local community and to the times. But yes. speaking of the times, another student who has been in my class this, this year is commenting on your, your comment about people living the rat race. So a, a book that I had students read in the fall, because we were doing online classes, which we still are. I mm. had them read a book called Mind, The Mindful Catholic by Dr. Gregory Botaro. Mm. And he talks about kind of just being the practice of being mindful and present in every moment day to day. Mm. But yet the culture we live in is constantly pulling us towards more prestige or more money or getting more things done. Mm. So he wants to know how was your experience as a nun, not to mention you are the cheese nun. So your mm. cheese is making, mm. how can we step out of this rat race? I mean, you mentioned visiting the monastery is precisely mm. one way of doing that. But when you come back home, when you're not in the monastery anymore, how do we step out mm. of this rat race? Well, you know, I know that when, we first went to the monastery and, you know, found peace. Um, the young people, we would be so afraid to leave thinking, uh oh, when I go home, is this gonna all go away? And the more you went, the more it stayed with you. And I think um, for those of us who are Catholic and receive the Eucharist, I think there's an exchange that happens, you know, in that eating, this is my body, this is my blood. When that happens and you get fed, there's a change that happens that's forever. So I think you find more and more it stays with you. And I think also, you know, for some guests, they come many times or they begin a relationship with someone in the community. Uh, and I think that that's part of it too. Um, you know, when you make a friend, uh, someone who cares about you, then that, you know, you bring with you and you get support. I think people feel so isolated and, and everyone needs some support of a friend or a counselor uh, or a group of friends. Uh, or you find that, I think, with, with your students. You know, you give that to your students above and beyond the classroom where people can feel, I can trust this person and open my soul to this person. And that's rare, that's hard to find. But I, I think everyone needs uh, support. Right. And that at the Abbey, you know, we give a lot of attention to each person to become who she's meant to be. Um, in the prologue, prologue of the Holy Rule, um, St. Benedict talks about this. Um, he says, de boni suis in nobis parendum est, Latin. <laughs> which means um, to serve God with the good things he has given us. And this good thing, that's something in the Abbey we call the bonum, the good. And what we find is, you know, people have no sense of the good that's in them, of who they are and that they're good. And I think people just get ground down um, and don't, realize how beautiful they are, the gifts they have, the gifts the families gave them. So we encourage that, that each one can find her bonum, the good that she brings and can develop that. And I think that's the same thing we do with our guests um, because sometimes you can't see it yourself when you're suffering, but you know, we can point out, you know, this is who you are and this is who you could be trusted. Wow. Well, this is going to be to have to be the final question before I wind down. But, you know, I thought that was beautiful. What you just said, helping everybody to find the good in them. And mm. most people don't know the good, the gifts that they have. But the one student wants to know, mm -hmm. how has your cheese making helped you understand the virtues and what a good life is, you know, and he mentions that, you know, in the Greco Roman, in the Greco Roman heritage, we have the, the we have the seven virtues and the good life in the Bible can be described as everyone sitting under their own vine and their own fig tree. Um, so 
there's the fruits of the spirit, right? So what do you mm -hmm. understand as a good life and how has that been influenced by your cheese making? Well, um, I think one of the things, um, you know, on this Fulbright that I was on, uh, that was very moving to me, you know, I not only did science, but I was studying uh, the, the lore and the history of the caves and the culture. And it was quite moving to see for these traditional cheesemakers, especially those who lived through World War II, how connected the cheese was to charity. Uh, one woman, um, her husband was taken by the Gestapo and she thought he would never come home. And she was a dairy farmer and he actually did come home uh, and, you know, was as thin as a rail. But when he walked through the door, she knew without question, and she told me this, that he had lived because she had shared her dairy products during the war. You know, there was this sense that you were given this fruit of the earth, uh, actually fruitier, you mentioned fruit of the earth. Many of these dairy cooperatives are called fruitier. And so there was this sense that if you have this cow, if you have this milk, that you share that with others. That's part of the bounty that God has given you. And we're all in this together to get through this war and to feed one another. Wow. So that was what, you know, some of the beautiful insights I was able to, um, they, they, they let me in on that world when I was in Europe, especially. Cheese making and charity, the good life, charity, giving to others. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, I know that you had to get, you had to arrange your schedule to be with us tonight. And I know mm -hmm. that cloistered nuns don't go out in the world very often. You're something of, anomal of an anomaly. And I think a cloistered nun doing a <laughs> webinar is kind of a unique thing. So it's kind of perfect though. Here I am in my little cell and here we all are, you know? So um, it's kind of perfect. I mean, I think everyone's been cloistered for a year now uh, during COVID. Indeed, we have. So I'm grateful yes. for this creative adaptation. And again, mm -hmm. it's another illustration of the rule that mm -hmm. although you are cloistered and you don't venture out very often, you don't, you know, it's not like you're on a public speaking tour here or you're mm -hmm. self-promoting or something, you know, mm -hmm. you did this, I think, because we share this, this mission of bringing the Benedictine mm -hmm. Uh, vision of poetic knowledge where all of harm, where all of creation comes into harmony and openness to that surprise, the unexpected, the, the analogical way, the symbolic meaning of creation and the importance of, of community and the importance of finding unity in diversity through work, through mm -hmm. prayer and through these practices of hospitality and of charity. And mm -hmm. I can say that I named Scala after um, chapter seven in the rule, yes. the, the chapter on humility. And Scala means ladder. Mm -hmm. And I chose that because I want students to strive for excellence and climb that ladder, but remaining balanced between body mm -hmm. and soul and also being, being grounded. So I was really struck by, you know, the image of um, angels climbing the ladder and you always, or you always feel like you're at the bottom rung of the ladder, sort of the bottom mm -hmm. falls out. And so this, this sense of humility that yes, we're approaching greatness and we're turning back that conversatio you talked about. We're always turning back towards this amazing good, but we never know exactly when we're going to reach it or how we're going to reach it. And that's yes. been my response to the rat race that we do strive mm -hmm. for great things, but with this, this peace, um, with this internal peace, with this appreciation of our gifts. So I wanna thank our co-sponsors tonight, the Catholic Studies Program at University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Thank all of the wonderful people who support Scala and make these events possible without your donations. We could not do this, much less take students to monasteries, which I hope to do when they're open once again. For those of you who are here yes. live, the video will be made available. We will share some of the resources, some of the references that were discussed tonight so that you can have access mm -hmm. to them and continue learning. And Mother Prioress Noella, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. And maybe someday we'll see you or your other participants here. Our Lady of the Rock. Check it out. Yes.
and you will do some Gregorian singing for kingdom building with a former rock singer, sister, mother, Noella Prioris, the cheese nun. Yes. It was great to have you. So great okay. to connect. And thank you again, Mother Noella. Okay. Have a good night. Good night.